Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for coming out here on this chilly evening. In fact, let's give ourselves a hand for coming out. <laughs> what a great crowd. We're thrilled to have the Progressive Village Performance Network here tonight. They will entertain us with two radio versions of Sherlock Holmes Mysteries as a part of the Westmont Reads program. I also want to thank you for your generosity this evening. All funds collected tonight will go towards future library programs and events. My name is Carol Soule, and I'm friend, uh, president of the Friends of the Westmont Public Library. Friends memberships help support events like this and other events at the library that they wouldn't be able to do without our funding. As a part of our fundraiser, we will be having a concession stand at the intermission. Please stop by. If you'd like to be a part of the Friends or have any questions, please feel free to see me anytime this evening. Thank you and enjoy the show. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Westmont Public Library brings you... Thomas Heffron and Daniel Sparks in The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Westmont Public Library, providing our community keys to lifelong learning, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And as for me, well, I'd like to tell you that a time like right now is the perfect time to curl up with a good book that I checked out from the Westmont Public Library. <laughs> I tell you, Westmont Public Library has all the books you would care to read. No excuses not to, really. You can go in and talk to the friendly librarians and volunteers to help you find the perfect book free with your library card, or you can download them directly from the privacy of your own home with ebooks downloads. Even reserve online with the SWAN system. Culture awaits you at the Westmont Public Library. And now, Let's visit our old friend and host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Ms. Cuneo. Good evening, Doctor. Why don't you tell us a little about this hour's story? Sand between a painting and its frame is the catalyst for our adventure this, this hour. This would never happen with framing from the frame makers at 10 North Cass Avenue. This, <laughs> this is true. Watson, but picture framing from the frame makers is easy to decipher with their large selection of fine quality wood and metal frames and keen eye for color and design. Every piece they have framed over the last 45 years is of exceptional caliber. I have had many items framed at the frame makers. Holmes himself has enlisted them to clean pipe tobacco smoke and fingerprints off artwork. I understand they have a generous coupon available at FrameMakersOnline.com. Style, imagination, craftsmanship, find it all at the Frame Makers. Precisely, Ms. Cuneo. As Holmes would say, the frame's afoot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, Doctor, you previously told me that this hour's story took place in the Casbah at Algiers. Yes, the Casbah. I remember it as the place of countless streets winding up and down past colorful cafes where a hundred tongues were spoken, and often a street would end in shadowy darkness, which a man would be foolhardy to enter alone. Yes, Miss Cuneo, that was the Casbah that Sherlock Holmes and I knew in that winter of 99. Well, how did you happen to be out there, Doctor? Uh, do you mind if I tell you the story from the start, Miss Cuneo? It really began on a wintry night in Baker Street, at the conclusion of a mysterious murder at the castle. A charming young girl sat on the sofa of our lodgings in Baker Street and talked to us. But Mr. Holmes, you can't say you'll have nothing more to do with the Montrevers. Miss, my dear Miss Tetfield, I have found the true murderer of the Dowager Countess and he committed suicide. Surely the case has ended. 
Yes, Mr. Holmes, you found the real murderer. But now I want you to find the unfortunate young man who fled England five years ago when he was suspected of the crime. Uh, this is a new development, Miss Tetfield. Please tell us about it. It's Douglas Milton I'm talking about. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He was the heir to the title, wasn't he? Yes, Mr. Holmes. He was a sensitive, artistic boy, and, and when he knew that he was under suspicion, he ran away. Mm -hmm. Of course, everyone regarded his flight as an admission of guilt. That is, until you found the real culprit, Mr. Holmes. I imagine, Miss Tatfield, that your interest in the missing boy is not entirely, shall we say, altruistic? <sighs> I'm in love with him, Dr. Watson. Oh. We were engaged to be married when he ran away. Mr. Holmes, you've got to find him. He must know that his name has been cleared and that he's inherited the title. Miss Tetfield, have you any direct news, any letter from your fiancé since he left five years ago? None. Any clues as to his hiding place? Uh, only this. It's a painting I received anonymously a year after he had left. Oh. It was sent from a forwarded address in London. Oh, here it is, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Oh, a small oil painting. Well, very good one, too, I'd say. Yes, it's a splendid sense of composition. And his use of color is unusually brilliant. Do you recognize this painting as the work of your fiancé, Miss Tetfield? I'm certain of it. Yes, wonderful use of color. Observe the delicate shadings of that sunset and the brilliant green of the oasis. This scene is extraordinarily reminiscent of the desert in North Africa. Yes! Yes, that's what made me say I was certain he'd gone abroad, Mr. Holmes. Uh, but why should he go to North Africa? A good place, Watson, for an Englishman who imagines himself to be escaping justice. Remember, the Foreign Legion is stationed there. Do you think he might have joined the Legion, Mr. Holmes? Mm, it would seem logical. No questions are asked of those who join it, and its colorful obscurity might easily appeal to a young fellow in trouble. Hello. Uh, what is it, Holmes? There are quite a few grains of sand in between the canvas and the frame here. Miss Tetfield, do you mind if I pry the canvas loose? Do anything you like, Mr. Holmes, if you give you any clues to Douglas's whereabouts. Give me your penknife, will you, Watson? Here you are. Thanks, old chap. Wait a minute. Here we are. Uh, can you see anything? Uh-huh. Look, the words Sharif and El Afron are stamped here. Sharif is probably the framer's name, and El Afron is a town some 50 miles from Algiers. That settles it. Miss Tetfield, I accept your case. Watson and I will go to Africa and try to find your fiancé, Douglas Milton. Monsieur Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I have heard of you so often, but I never thought I should see you here at the headquarters of the Foreign Legion. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Well, Colonel de Bresson, I'm trying to trace an Englishman who's been missing during the past four years. I've reason to believe that he might have joined the Legion. Ah, I should look in my records. Let me see. Four years ago would be 1895. If Sherlock Holmes is tracking him, then I suppose he was in trouble in his own country. If he was in trouble, he might easily have come to us. We ask no questions. 97, 96, ah, 95. In that year, three Englishmen joined us. One of them died of dysentery two years ago in Sidi Rashid. One of them deserted 18 months ago, and we have been unable to trace him. The third is my adjutant, who brought you into my office just now. And he is, I would say, about three inches shorter than Douglas Milton. And men do not shrink in the Foreign Legion, eh, Colonel? No, they do not, Miss your Holmes. Uh, then the fellow who deserted must be our man. Unless it's the one who died of dysentery. Colonel de Bresson, how would you advise us to set about trying to find a deserter? Monsieur Holmes, there's only one place in Algeria where a man can hide from the Foreign Legion and remain hidden. Oh, and what's that place? The Casbah in Algiers. Then that's our destination, Watson. Be very careful, please, gentlemen. The Casbah is a place where the law is exiled. The police have no jurisdiction there. The only rule is that of strength, violence, and trickery. We shall be very cautious, I assure you. Goodbye, Colonel de Bresson, and thank you for your help.
Uh, well, I must say that I think Colonel de Brazon rather exaggerated uh, the dangers of the Casbah. <laughs> I suppose you're going to tell me this cafe is the, the headquarters for a, a dope smuggling ring or white slaving or something. Its ramifications are even more extensive than those you've mentioned. Uh, you're joking, Holmes. I assure you I'm not, old fellow. What? My old friend Dumel is chief of police in Algiers. When I told him our mission, he advised me to come here. A 500 franc note, and the proprietor can obtain any and all information regarding the underworld. For as little as 200 francs, he can arrange a murder. So that gives you some idea of the relative values in the Casbah. Good Lord. Then you've already spoken to the proprietor. Oh, yes, yes. A charming, scoundrelly fellow by the name of Rafi. I gave him 500 francs and asked him to set his underworld grapevine in motion to see whether an Englishman living in hiding here in the Casbah could be found. <laughs> and I thought we'd come here for a quiet meal. <laughs> here comes Rafi now. Let's hope he has good news for us. Here we are, Rafi. Come sit down, won't you? Ah, Rafi works fast, does he not, Mr. Holmes? Uh, your friend is... My friend knows that you're working with me. What have you found out? A drink first. The tongue of Rafi is parched. <laughs> Would you have me die of thirst before I give you my news? Uh, Vermouth Cassis. Oui, oui, Monsieur Rafi. Uh, you have good news for me, then? But yes. Good. What is it? First... You will pay me more money, no? But I gave you 500 francs. You said that you'd do the job for that. Can I help it if some tongues are more costly to make wag than others? <laughs> it took 500 to get the wag. Am I to have nothing for my own troubles? Ah, good, good. The gentleman will pay for it. <laughs> there you are. Merci, monsieur. I will drink to your health, gentlemen, both of you. You will pay me more money, no? But my friend's already given you 500. You should stick to your bargain, my good fellow. My information is a bargain at 750 francs. It would be a bargain at 1,000. But Rafi will let you have it for 750. Because he likes you. <laughs> I see. You will give it to me? No? And if I refuse? <laughs> then you get no information. And uh, perhaps I spread news in the Casbah that makes it uncomfortable for you gentlemen to be there. Great Scott, this is blackmail. I get the money, no? <laughs> You're a scoundrel, Rafi. Of course I'm a scoundrel. Here's your money. The information? There is an Englishman hiding in the Casbah. I do not know his name, but he is tall and fair-haired. I cannot tell you where he lives, but if you go to the cafe of a thousand sighs, you will find a girl who sings there. A girl who sings like a nightingale. Her name is Aisha, and she can lead you to your Englishman. A girl named Aisha in the Cafe of a Thousand Sighs. Now that is right. Uh, I suggest you go there in disguise. Two well-dressed Englishmen might find themselves in trouble. Uh, for a small fee, say 200 francs, I will escort you there myself. <laughs> thank you, thank you, yes. I, I think we can manage by ourselves, Rafi. Oh, well, if your business is concluded quickly and time weighs heavy on your hands, Rafi can take you to some places of rare interest. Dancing girls that wither one's eyeballs with their beauty. For 500 francs, gentlemen. Thank you, Rafi, thank you. I have a feeling that time will not weigh heavily on our hands. Good night. You work too hard, gentlemen. You should learn how to play. Good night. <laughs> Upon my soul, I think that fellow's the biggest blackguard I ever met. <laughs> <laughs> I quite agree, old chap, but he is amusing. <laughs> uh, by the way, Holmes, uh, don't you think that when this case is finished, we might have um, uh, time on our hands? <laughs> Watson, you're incorrigible. But I think... Watson. What is it? Look at the woman sitting over in the corner by herself. By Jove, yes. Her, mm, her face seems familiar. 
We've seen her before somewhere. And of course we have. Her name is Olivia Leeming. We met her at the inquest on the Montrevor case. Ah, so we did. Now, what on earth do you suppose she's doing here in the Casbah? Not on a holiday, I'm sure. Ms. Olivia Leeming, if you recall, is a cousin of Douglas Milton's, the man we are searching for. If Milton were ever declared legally dead, Ms. Leeming over there would inherit the title's fortune. It looks to me as if we're not the only people in the Casbah who are searching for the missing heir. That's true, old fellow. Come on, let's go and talk to the lady. Ms. Olivia Leeming, how very odd to meet you here. Well, well, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Won't you sit down? Thank you. The world's a small place. Or has someone said that before? I wondered if you'd spot me here in the corner. Oh, you saw us then. Oh, but of course. But you were in such deep conversation with that scoundrel, Raffi. I didn't like to disturb you. <laughs> very considerate of you, I'm sure. Why are you here, Ms. Leeming? Oh, I'm, I'm making a business trip, and, and this is my day off. As I recall it, you're in the publishing business. Well, correct. What a memory you have, Mr. Holmes. It seems peculiar that you should be on a business trip here. Are you planning on opening a publishing house in Algiers? Or are you searching the Casbah for new authors? And why not? I'm a great believer in encouraging new talent. Ms. Leeming. Why don't you admit that you're here for the express purpose of trying to find your cousin, Douglas Milton? Mr. Holmes, you've discovered my secret. The great Sherlock Holmes and his watchdog have their eagle eyes on me. They know that I'll inherit the fortune if Douglas Milton dies. Yes, Ms. Leeming, we know that fact. And you fathom my plan to find Douglas before you and kill him so that I may inherit the riches that come with the title. How lucky I am to meet you in the Casbah where you cannot arrest me. Well, it's a race against time, gentlemen, but I have a head start, as you will soon find out. Goodbye, and the best of luck to you. Hmm. What an extraordinary lady. Uh, she's joking, of course. I believe not, Watson. I think she labors under the whimsical belief that the best method of discounting the truth is to state it baldly so that it will not be believed. Great Scott! Then we must work fast. Yes, old chap, we must. I am sure that we're entrance in a race against death. We must get back to the hotel and into our disguises as quickly as possible. After that, we shall visit a young lady named Aisha in the cafe of a thousand sighs. And I am certain, Watson, that it will be the first time two men have ever entered the Casbah for the express purpose of preventing a murder. We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just about a second, which gives me time to remind you that if you like to watch DVDs at home or play video games, the easiest way to reserve your copy is through the Westmont Public Library website. <laughs> Don't forget, the librarians are always handy to serve you and offer you assistance, all free to the friendly people of Westmont and the surrounding area. Well, doctor, I can hardly wait to hear what happened next. You and Sherlock Holmes went back to the hotel, I suppose. Uh, yes, Miss Cuneo. Holmes quickly adopted the disguise of an Arab guide, while I assumed the role of a tourist, and we started off on our search. Outside the Cafe of a Thousand Sighs, we met with a rude shock. Good Lord, it's the woman we met in the cafe. Yes, Olivia Leeming, with a knife between her shoulders. She's dead, Holmes. Shouldn't we get in touch with the police? What can they do? Remember, there is no law in the Casbah. In any case, this woman is beyond our help. Our job is to protect the living. Come on, old fellow. Let's go to the Cafe of a Thousand Sighs and find this girl, Aisha, the girl Rafi says sings like a nightingale. Je l'appelle ma petite bourgeoise, mon ton kiki, mon ton kiki, mon ton quinoise. Il y en a qui me font des yeux, mais c'est elle qui j'aime le mieux. <laughs> oh, so that's Aisha. Oh, she's very beautiful. Don't forget our role of tourist and guide, old chap. Master, would wish to meet this Aisha? Oh, very much indeed. I will see if it can be arranged, Master. Wait here for me, Watson. I'll see what I can do. Right you are, Holmes. Be careful now. 
Mademoiselle Aisha? What do you want, greasy one? There is an Englishman at the table over there. He wishes to talk to Aisha. Which one is he? The man who sits at the table in the corner. He's very rich, Aisha, and he admires you a great deal. He told me to give you this 500 franc note. So? Very well. You may bring him to my rooms. The door is at the top of stairway to the right. Good, Aisha. I fetch him. I shall be waiting. Aisha will see you, master. Follow me, please. Oh, very well. I, I hope you know how you're going to handle this, Holmes. Don't worry, Watson. In this case, I think honesty will be the best policy. Well, I'm not so sure. This place is a thieves' kitchen if ever I saw one. You better be careful. First door to the right at the top of the stairs. This is it. Come in. Oh, come and sit over here, Mr. Englishman. Greasy one, you may leave us. Mademoiselle, I uh, may as well tell you at once that I am not an Arab guide. My name is Sherlock Holmes. What do you want with me? Why you trick your way in here? Don't be frightened, Mademoiselle. I can explain our mission in a very few words. My friend and I have come in search of an Englishman by the name of Douglas Milton. We have good news for him. What make you think I might know of him? A gentleman by the name of Rafi suggested that you might. What is your good news for this Englishman? That he has been cleared of suspicion of murder and that he is the rightful Earl of Montrevor. That means when he knows this, he will leave the Casbah and return to his country? Uh, naturally, my dear. Uh, I do not know this man. I have never heard of him. Here is your 500 franc. Goodbye. Not so fast, Aisha, my petite you. I've been listening from behind those curtains. Gentlemen, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Douglas Milton. Oh, Douglas Milton! Oh, we found you at last. <laughs> it gives me infinite pleasure to have succeeded in my mission. How do you do, sir? Well, this is very exciting. Oh, it is indeed. <laughs> yes, I think the occasion calls for a drink. Um, what will it be, gentlemen? Oh, I think um, a glass of port would be very nice, sir. Yes, it would be most appropriate for toasting the new Earl of Montrevor. Splendid, splendid. Aisha, bring glasses and a bottle of port and some cream de menthe for me. You are not going to England. I will never let you leave me. Oh, Aisha, stop being so melodramatic. Please, bring me two bottles and some glasses. Very well. I'm sorry. Mr. Holmes, I can't tell you how I appreciate your trouble in coming all this way to find me. But, well, I must tell you, there is one problem that makes it difficult for me to leave this country. You see, I've deserted from the Foreign Legion. Uh, yes, 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 we know that, my boy. In fact, that's how we first got onto your trail. I shouldn't let that fact worry you, Mr. Milton. I'm certain the British Consul in Algiers can arrange to have any charges dropped against a peer of the realm. Oh, well, I've never thought of that. Here are the bottles. You must excuse these gentlemen, these glasses, gentlemen. Tumblers are hardly correct, I, I suppose. But, well, they won't spoil the flavor, I'm sure. Ah, uh, two glasses of port and a cream de menthe for me. Only three glasses, Aisha? Bring a glass for yourself. I do not wish to drink. And I insist that you do. Bring a glass, Aisha. Why should I drink if you are leaving me? Mr. Milton, do you know Olivia Leeming? Huh? Of course. She's my cousin. Yes, yeah, she came here a half hour ago and threatened me. Uh, did you also know that she's lying dead in the street, murdered? Well, yes, I did. If we weren't here in the Casbah, I wouldn't tell you this. But Aisha stabbed her. She followed her when she left here, killed her, and then slipped back just in time to sing her song a few moments ago. Oh, you didn't need to look so shocked, Dr. Watson. Life is cheap in the Casbah. Aisha is a girl of violent passions. Come on. Let's drink. A toast to the new Earl of Montrevor. <coughs> oh, excuse me, sir. You took the wrong glass. Uh, you're drinking my port. Oh, silly mistake. I can't bear port. Very un-English me, I'm afraid. But, well, 
After all these years, I don't feel particularly English. In fact, I'll probably find it very hard to adjust to myself and my old life when I go back, or perhaps should I say, if I go back. Since you feel that way about it, Mr. Milton, why go? You can claim the title and the revenues of the estate without leaving Algeria. You could stay here and live on the income. I didn't realize that would be possible. Are you sure I can do that? Oh, yes. I am quite certain of it. Hmm. But if you doubt my word, I suggest we all adjourn to the British consulate in Algiers. They can put you straight on the matter. That's a good idea. Let's go over there at once. And now I have been listening to you, my friend. You are planning to leave me. Once you go from the Casbah, I shall never see you again. <laughs> Anish, put down that knife, Aisha. I will not let you go. You belong to me. If you try to leave me now, I will kill you. Put down that knife, Aisha. You've done enough damage for one night. Why, you... I... Put it down, you fool. Put it down. Let me go. Let me go. Ah! <gasps> she twisted the knife on herself as she fell. Holmes, help me turn her over. She's dead, Mr. Milton. Poor Aisha. It's a bloody path that leads to the Montrevor title, sir. I suggest that we see that this poor girl's body is taken care of, and then go to the British consulate without any further delay. Now that we're at the consulate, Mr. Milton, I suggest that you swear on oath that you are Douglas Milton heir to the Montrevor estate. This woman is a commissioner of oaths. Then we can go in and see the consul. Very well. Now, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I hereby solemnly swear that I am Douglas Milton, the missing heir to the Montrevor estate. I hereby swear that I am Douglas Milton, missing heir the, to the Montrevor estate. Thank you, sir. And now, if you'll sign the statement, these gentlemen can witness it. There you are. Thank you, sir. And now if you gentlemen will sign? Yes, certainly. Thank you, gentlemen. The document is now legal. Splendid. Now let's go over to see the council. Not yet, my friend. Watson, this man is not Douglas Milton. What the devil are you talking about? There is no law in the Casbah, sir, so you cannot be punished for the two murders you committed there. But now that your avarice has tempted you here to Algiers, where you've been foolish enough to sign a false statement, I think we can at least settle you very nicely for desertion, false impersonation, forgery, and perjury. Holmes, what do you mean? The story should be obvious, old fellow. Olivia Leeming did track down the deserter. Recognition was uncertain after so many years, but at least it gave this man the idea of impersonating the real Douglas Milton, a friend of his. You have a lively imagination, Mr. Holmes. The real Douglas Milton died of dysentery two years ago in Sidi Rashid. As soon as the idea of impersonating Milton was born, Leeming had to die. Your theories are very interesting, but you haven't a shred of proof. I say that I am Douglas Milton. How are you going to prove otherwise? Very simply, my dear sir. Douglas Milton was a painter, a painter who excelled in the use of vivid colors. You, sir, suffer from the quite common malady of red-green color blindness. Less than an hour ago, you mistook a glass of port, which is red, for a glass of creme de menthe, which is green. I knew at once that you were an imposter. You're cleverer than I thought you were, Holmes. Goodbye. <gasps> here, here, come back! No, no, Watson, don't go after him. Uh, but we can't let him escape, Holmes. Don't worry, old chap, he won't escape. I sent a message to Colonel de Brisson. If you go to the window, I think you'll find that the consulate is being watched. The Legion has a long memory for desertion. I don't think he'll get very far. Oh, they got him, Holmes. Shot him as he was trying to run away. A just death for him. He lived a life of violence and treachery, Watson. It's only fitting that he should die in the same manner. Doctor, that was a swell story, but you know something? I wish you hadn't disillusioned me about the Casbah. 
Uh, disillusioned you? Uh, why? What do you mean? Well, before I heard your story, whenever somebody mentioned the Casbah, I'd always visualize a very glamorous, romantic sort of place. <laughs> no. Yep. <laughs> and I could just see myself, a beautiful girl in the Casbah, being approached by a handsome man who would whisper in a fine French accent, Darling, you are sensational. You are lovely, gorgeous. Tell me, did you know that the Westmont Public Library, located <laughs> at 428 North Cass Avenue, hosts events and programs for adults, kids, and teens all year round? It's wonderful. <laughs> well, you must admit, Doctor, that that is the truth. It is a wonderful place, and it certainly ought to be. <laughs> You're incorrigible. <laughs> <laughs> well, after all, it's so easy to get a library card and put it to good use right up the street at the Westmont Public Library. Get your library card or dust off the one you've had for years and get involved. Start reading and even join a book club. Well, Doctor, I suppose you're ready to tell us about next hour's story? Yes, and as soon as I have, I want you to meet a friend of mine. A friend? Yes, uh, but first, Miss Cuneo, next hour, I'm going to tell you an adventure in which, for once, Holmes came off second best. Hmm. An exciting story of high society and romance. I call it A Scandal in Bohemia. Boy, that sounds swell. And now, what about your friend? Well, she's waiting at the microphone in San Francisco. She's Dr. Ruby Porter, and she wants to tell us about something very important. Dr. Ruby Porter. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Radio listeners, tonight in Westmont, there are hundreds, even thousands, who want to perform on stage in front of a real audience, not just the mirror in their bedroom. PVPN is the perfect place to get your start, whether you are young or old. If you're seasoned and threw down your hairbrush microphone years ago, Come and join PVPN and put your talents to work here in Westmont. There's nothing like the PVPN theatrical experience. Citizens of Westmont and surrounding suburbs get to see theater in various genres, young adult, musicals, drama, comedy, you name it, PVPN's got it. Well, plus, you can't beat the team of producers and directors. PVPN, the Progressive Village Performance Network, is here to inspire nurture, challenge, amaze, educate, and empower artists and audience in order to artistically enhance our village through a device access in a variety of participation activities. Thank you, Dr. Ruby Porter. I know that our friends listening in will log on to the PVPN website, pvpn.weebly.com, to find the schedules of the year's shows Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Crooked Man. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. My, 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 if it isn't Skeeter. If the wind blows too hard, he'll blow right over. Leave him alone, Biff. He's a nice boy. Yeah, nice, small fry. And just what the girls want, right? Nice and weak. Hey there, you two. How's about a soda, Kitty? Listen here, Pally. Kitty wants nothing to do with you. She's my gal. Sorry, Biff. I didn't know Kitty couldn't have a soda with whoever she wanted. You better watch it, you gangly old spaghetti noodle. You step foot into the soda fountain, and you'll be the laughing stock of the town. Sorry, Skeeter. Maybe some other time? <laughs> yeah, when pigs fly. Biff, you don't need to be so harsh. He's just a gentle man. I don't want to hurt his feelings. If you want a gentle girl, go have a soda with your girly friends. One day, Biff, you just watch out. Watch out? <laughs> That's a laugh. What are you going to do, Fink? Well... Well, you'll just see. I'll show him. I'll get hard-boiled and show him a thing or two. I'm going to go to the Westmont Fitness Club. He'll see. 
I'm going to lift weights and run and try some sports. This skeeter won't be some Valentino. It can't be. <laughs> what? Who? Hello, Kitty. Nice to see you again. Are you still with that goon? Yes, Skeeter, you too. Would you like a hand with your jacket? Skeeter? What's buzzing, cousin? <laughs> Kitty, uh, don't you... Biff, don't snap your cap. My, my, Skeeter, something about you has changed. You seem more <clears throat> confident. What's changed? How do do, Kitty? You must be referring to my muscular body and chiseled face. Why, yes. What a change, I must say. I put down my studies for a few hours and made a trip to the Westmont Park District Gym, Westmont Fitness. All that at the Westmont Fitness? Yes, sirree. Hey, sugar, are you rationed? Uh, not anymore. I don't have a date for the, shin the shindig this Friday, and... This chump? Biff, Skeeter's the big cheese now. Yeah. Hey, Kitty, want to ditch this flat tire and fetch a soda? You're not weak anymore, Skeeter. Just weak in the knees. Sure thing, doll. A trip to Westmont Fitness never hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Biff. Catch you later. Margaret, would you like a glass of cold hibiscus tea? Sandra, you make everything look so perfect. How do you have time to make hibiscus tea after you've been ironing and baking cakes all day? Are you silly? After I put the pie on the windowsill to cool this afternoon, all I had to do is twist the cap of this Hamica Tea's hibiscus tea. How sophisticated. I'd love a glass of Hamica Tea's tea then, if you put it that way. Hamica hibiscus tea cools me down after my household chores before Kenneth gets home from work. I look refreshed and relaxed, ready for his arrival through that front door. Oh, Sandra, you always look so fresh and beautiful. It's because I drink Hamica Tea's tea for its inherent health benefits and naturally sweet, refreshing taste. Rich in vitamins and antioxidants, this wonderful brew will cool you down as it supercharges your immune system. With no caffeine, no additives, low sugar, and no preservatives, it's an ideal family beverage. No wonder you're so slim and trim. You make everything look so effortless. It is, Margaret. Say, let's perk up before our husbands get home with some hibiscus tea then. We'll have some tea and pat the pillows just in time for their arrival. When Kenneth gets home from his hard day at work, all he wants is to be greeted with a smile and a bow in my hair. Don't forget a Manhattan... Don't forget a Manhattan on the rock, Sandra. Oh, I've gotten quite adventurous. I mix hibiscus tea with a cocktail or two. Hibiscus makes for a wonderful healthy mixer, and Kenneth just loves the new twist. Bathe the kids, do a last minute spruce up, put on some Glenn Miller, and wait with a Jamaica tea hibiscus tea cocktail for two. I love the exotic flavors and natural sweetness of Jamaica teas. Oh, and by the way, Margaret, you can now purchase Jamaica teas at the Whole Foods Market in Willowbrook. Oh. That being Crosby, sure can sing and dance. I just love Ingrid Bergman. Can you believe that wonderful drama, Citizen Kane? That Orson Welles is a genius. I'd venture to guess there is no better movie than Casablanca. It won the Academy Award in 1943. Oh, and how about the Jane Austen story, Pride and Prejudice? When they made that film, I think they broke the mold. That piece of cinema could never be remade. It was perfection. Classics. <sighs> if only we could put Going My Way and The Lost Weekend and the others into a time capsule so we could cherish them forever. I never forget, want to forget the time we went to see the cinema and see Grapes of Wrath. Remember that night? Henry Fonda. He's really going to go somewhere. I remember, darling. If only we could savor the moment and watch it at home. 
if only. Some folks have a television. Not sure why when we have everything we need coming from the radio. Well, in a magical world, there would be television for everyone to watch and a way to watch Jimmy Cagney on it, too. Who knows what that futuristic contraption would be, but it sure would be nice to savor our favorite classic movies. I hear there is a picture show store in Westmont called Westmont Classic Movies. Do you suppose Westmont Classic Movies has our favorite movies? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Surely they would if there were such a thing, dear. Surely they would. Westmont Classic Movies at 307 and a half Ogden Avenue. Reminisce with your favorite classics today. Hello again. Now, before we get started with this hour's story, we ask the members of our live studio audience to take a look under their seats. If you are sitting in a seat with a magnifying glass taped on the underside of your chair, you are a winner. You all want to take a look. <laughs> Okay, after tonight's show, please bring your magnifying glass up to the stage to claim your prize. Prizes are generously donated by Frame Makers and PVPN, the Progressive Village Performance Network. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service, Westmont. Public Library brings you Thomas Heffron and Daniel Sparks in The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Westmont Public Library, providing our community keys to lifelong learning, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And you know something? I had an adventure tonight in the privacy of my own home, curled up in bed while I was reading the 12th in the series of the Kinsey Milhone Alphabet Mysteries. Last week it was romance, and the week before that my adventure was suspense. All my reading adventures were courtesy of the Westmont Public Library, where I can always retreat into my own adventure. And now, I know Dr. Watson's waiting for us, so let's go in and join him. Now, come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Oh, good evening, Miss Cuneo. Oh, well, you're quite muffled up tonight, I see. Uh, overcoat, scarf, and gloves? Slip them off and come join me by the fire. Thanks, Doctor. Quite a nip in the air. Oh, there is indeed. Well, Doctor, you told us last hour that our next story is centered around the activities of a brilliant and beautiful woman. Uh, yes, my dear. Her name was Irene Adler, but I never knew Holmes to refer to her by any other name than the woman. Well, she sounds mighty intriguing. How did you happen to meet up with her? Well, I'll tell you the story from the beginning. One night, it was the 20th of March, 1888 to be exact, I was returning home from a visit to a patient when my steps led me through Baker Street. Since my marriage, I hadn't seen much of Sherlock Holmes, and I thought and that And you couldn't resist stopping by 221B, I'm sure, Doctor. <laughs> of course I couldn't. As I stood outside the well-remembered door, I looked up at the lighted windows and saw the tall, spare figure of my old friend pass twice in dark silhouette against the blind. He was pacing the room swiftly, eagerly, with his head sunk on his chest and his hands clasped behind him. To me, who knew his every mood and habit, his attitude and manner told their own story. He was hot on the scent of some new problem. I rang the bell and a few moments later found myself standing before him. Marriage suits you, Watson. You look in splendid shape. Oh, yes, Holmes. I feel very well, thanks. And in practice again, I see. You didn't tell me that you'd gone back into harness. Oh, how do you know? Elementary, my dear chap. 
If a gentleman walks into my room smelling of iodoform, with a black mark of nitrate of silver on his right forefinger, and a bulge on the left side of his hat to show where he has secreted his stethoscope, I should be dull indeed if I didn't pronounce him to be an active member of the medical profession. <laughs> oh, same as ever, Holmes. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm, um, I'm not um, interrupting you, am I? Yes, you are, old fellow, but it's a most welcome interruption. Oh, you're working on a new case? It looks like it. This letter arrived by the last post today. It's undated and has neither signature nor address. Read it. Well, let's have a look. There will call upon you tonight at a quarter to eight o'clock a gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of the very deepest moment. Uh, your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe have shown that you are one who may safely be trusted. This account of you we have from all quarters received. Hmm. Be in your chamber then at that hour and do not take it amiss if your visitor wears a mask. <laughs> Great Scott, it all sounds very mysterious. Uh, what do you imagine it means? Look carefully at the note, Watson. What do you deduce from it? Oh, let's see. Uh, well, the man who wrote it was presumably well-to-do. Such paper couldn't be bought for under half a crown a packet. And it's peculiarly strong and stiff. Peculiar. That's the very word. It's not an English paper at all. Hold it up to the light. You notice anything? Uh, yes. There's a, a large E with a small G. Mm-hmm. Oh, and a large G with a small T woven into the texture of the paper. What does that suggest to you? Well, the name of the maker, no doubt, or perhaps his monogram. Not at all, my dear fellow. The G with a small T stands for Gesellschaft, which is the German for company. And the E-G? That stands for Egria. Egria? It's in a German-speaking country in Bohemia, not far from Carlsbad. Oh, so the paper was made in Bohemia. Undoubtedly. And the man who wrote the note is a German. Hmm. How do you know that? Observe the curious construction of the sentence. This account of you we have from all quarters received. A Frenchman or a Russian could not have written that. It's the German who is so discourteous to his verbs. Oh, there's your client now. I'd better go home. No, 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 no. Unless you have to. Well, I, I could stay. I thought perhaps that Then, maybe... my dear chap, stay by all means. I'm lost without my Boswell. And this promises to be interesting. I told Mrs. Hudson to let the masked visitor come upstairs unannounced. Come in. Good evening, sir. You, uh, you received my note? Yes, indeed. Come in, won't you, and sit down. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. You may say anything before him you can say to me. Whom have I the honor to address? You may address me as uh, Count Van Kram. How do you do, sir? You must excuse this mask that I wear. The august person who employs me wishes his agent to be unknown to you. And I may confess at once that the title by which I have just called myself is not exactly my own. I was well aware of that fact, sir. You see, Mr. Holmes, the matter I am about to discuss implicates the great house of Ormstein, hereditary kings of Bohemia. That had not escaped me either, sir. In fact, if you will state your case, I shall be better able to advise you. Your Majesty? How? How did you? Yes. Yes, I am the king. Why should I attempt to conceal it? Why, indeed? I shall remove the mask. There. Mr. Holmes, I have traveled incognito from Prague for the express purpose of consulting you. Then pray, consult. Briefly, the facts are these. Some five years ago, during a visit to Warsaw, I made the acquaintance of the well-known adventuress, Irene Adler. Irene Adler? Oh, we know of her, Your Majesty. Look her up in the index for me, will you, Watson? It's right beside you on the desk there. I imagine that her name would not be unfamiliar to you. Um, here we are, here we are. Um, A, Abrams, Acton Green, Hatchet Murders, uh, Adler. Ah, Adler. Splendid. Hand me the file, old chap. Thank you. Mm hmm. Irene Adler, born in New Jersey in the United States of America in 1858. Contralto. Mm hmm. Prima Donna, Imperial Opera of Warsaw. Oh. 
Retired from operatic stage, living in London, quite so. And here's a recent notation. Uh huh. Your Majesty, as I understand, became entangled with this young person, wrote her some compromising letters, and is now desirous of getting those letters back. Precisely so. But how could you- Was there a secret marriage? None. No legal papers or certificates? Uh, no. Then I fail to follow, Your Majesty. If this young lady should produce her letters for blackmailing purposes, how is she to prove their authenticity? There is the handwriting. Uh, that could be a forgery, Your Majesty. But it was private note paper. Stolen. My own seal. Imitated. My photograph. Bought. But we were both in the photograph. Oh, dear me. Yes, that's very bad. Your Majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion. Uh, did you inscribe this photograph, Your Majesty? Yes, Dr. Watson. I'm afraid I did. Oh, good gracious me. Mr. Holmes, it must be recovered. Perhaps if you were to pay enough, the photograph might be bought. She refuses to sell. Stolen, then. Five attempts have been made. Twice, burglars in my pay ransacked her house. Once, we diverted her luggage when she traveled. Twice, she has been waylaid. There has been no result. Oh, dear. It's quite a pretty little problem. It is a deadly serious one to me. Your Majesty, what does Miss Adler intend to do with the photograph? To ruin me. How, sir? Well, I'm about to be married to the second daughter of the King of Scandinavia. She is the very soul of delicacy. A shadow of a doubt as to my conduct would bring the matter to an end. And Irene Adler threatens to send the photograph to your fiancé, I suppose. Yes, and she will do it. Rather than let me marry another woman, there are no lengths to which she would not go. None. Are you sure that she hasn't already sent it, Your Majesty? I am sure. And why? She said she would send it on the day my betrothal is publicly announced. That day will be next Monday. Splendid. Then we still have three days. Your Majesty will, of course, stay in London for the present? Yes, certainly. You will find me at the Langham Hotel, registered as Count Van Kram. Just two questions before you leave. What are they? Is the photograph large or small? Quite large. And it, it was in a heavy frame. I see. And what is Irene Adler's London address, please? Ryanie Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. Thank you, Your Majesty. Good night. And I trust that we shall soon have some good news for you. I am placing all my hopes in you, Mr. Holmes. Good night. Good night, Dr. Watson. Good night, Your Majesty. Fascinating problem, Holmes. I wish I could help you with it. You can, my dear chap. I shall be glad of your company. What's our first move, Holmes? A good night's rest. We'll meet here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And then? Then, my dear fellow, we will see what we can find out about Miss Irene Adler, late of the Warsaw Imperial Opera Company, and at present residing at Bryony Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. <laughs> Holmes, I guess the examination of Bryony Lodge didn't prove very illuminating. No. A bijou residence that represents the essence of dignified suburbia, but tells us very little about the owner. I think a visit to the local public house might prove more instructive. Come on, old chap. I see the door of the coach and horse is inviting us from across the road. Well, our disguises shouldn't cause any suspicion. And that's why I suggested them. In the character of a couple of stable hands, I felt that we might inspire confidence. This is a horsey neighborhood, and there's a wonderful sympathy and Freemasonry among their fraternity. Here we are. Better let me do most of the talking. Yes, I will. I'm sure your accent will be more convincing than mine. Let's go in, shall we? Well, what it be, mateys? Half a bowl of malt, please. How about you, Charlie? All out the same. Two half of old and mild. Here we are, mateys. Yeah, that'll be our tenor. Have a drink with us, governor. Don't mind if I do. I'll have a Guinness. You blokes new around here? Oh, yes. We just come over from Clapham. Clapham, eh? Well, here's looking at you. You for jobs? Yes, that's right. 
We was told the Miss Atla across at Briny Lodge needed a new coachman and groom. Well, that's the first I've heard of it. But it might be true. Have you been over there to ask? No, not yet. We thought we'd find out something about the old girl first. Ho, ho, ho. She ain't no old girl, matey. She's the prettiest young thing you ever saw under a bonnet, and that's a fact. You know her, Governor? No, well, yes, of course, I know her. Used to drive a carriage, I did, before I came to work here. Oh, what's she like? Well, as nice a little lady as you'll find, chump. Work you hard? No, 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 no. She lives quiet like, goes out singing at concerts once in a while. Rest of the time, it's money for gin. She goes out for a drive in the park every day at 5 and comes back to dinner at 6.30. Rest of the time's your own. Oh, she ain't married, you say? No, no. But she's got a bloke what comes to see her all the time. He's a barrister. Nice gentleman. Mr. Jeffrey Norton is his name. Good looking fella. Wouldn't be surprised to see him get spliced. Sounds like a nice cushy job to me. Come on, Charlie. Let's get over to the house and see what's what. Much obliged to you, chump. Good luck, mateys. Good night. And thanks for the Guinness. What's our next move, Holmes? Let's stroll back to Bryony Lodge, shall we? I'm undecided whether to continue my investigations there or to try and find out something about Mr. Jeffrey Norton, the barrister. If he is just her lawyer and nothing else, it's more than likely that she's entrusted the photograph to his safekeeping. Hello, there's a cab waiting outside Miss Adler's house. Hurry, Watson, it may be Mr. Norton's. Here we are at the gate. Yes, here comes a man hurrying down the pathway. Quick, behind this post, listen. Where to now, Mr. Norton? Drive like the devil. First to Gross and Hankies in Regent Street, and then to the Church of St. Monica and Edgware Road. Half our sovereign if you do it in 20 minutes. Right you are, Mr. Norton, hop in. Try and signal a cab, Watson. We must follow him. Here comes one. No, no it isn't. It's a private carriage. Miss Adler's no doubt. Here she comes down the pathway. Back again behind the post, Watson. Where to, Miss Adler? The Church of St. Monica, Jane, and half a sovereign if you reach it in 20 minutes. The game's afoot. Quick, we must get a cab and follow them. Oh, here comes a handsome. Cabby, hey, hey, cabby. Folks got enough money to take a cab. Here's half a sovereign for you, miss. Oh, right you are. Where to, governor? The Church of St. Monica in the Edgware Road. And another half sovereign to you if you get us there in 20 minutes. We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. But let me tell you something. If you're ever looking for a fun and friendly place to volunteer your time, you should try the Westmont Public Library. Adults and teens are encouraged to get involved, make new friends, and volunteer. Just download an application on the WPL Library website and contact their volunteer coordinator. Well, doctor, again, you broke off your story at the most exciting point. Did you and Sherlock Holmes reach that church inside the 20 minutes? Yes, Miss Cuneo, we did, but the other carriages were there before us. Holmes went into the church after telling me to guard the outside. I must have waited for 10 minutes or more before Mr. Jeffrey Norton and Miss Adler came out, spoke a few words to each other, and then left, then and there in their separate conveyances. A moment later, Holmes, still dressed as a stable hand, came striding out of the church and down the steps towards me. He was obviously very excited. Watson! Watson, have they left? Yes, in separate cabs. I overheard him say that he was going back to his office. And she said, I shall drive out in the park at 5 o'clock as usual. Splendid. Then come on. We can return to Baker Street. What happened inside the church, Holmes? They were married. Uh, married? Of course. The ceremony would have been illegal if performed after noon. That accounted for their wild dash to the church. Jump into the cab, old fellow. Where to now, Governor? 221B Baker Street. Oh, so they got married, eh? Yes. 
And it may amuse you to know that I acted as witness at the ceremony. You did? But how did that happen? <laughs> Their own witness had failed to appear, and I was dragged into the breach. The bride gave me this sovereign as a memento. I uh, think I'll wear it on my watch chain in memory of the occasion. <laughs> what an amazing situation. Things, think, things begin to look better for the king, don't they? Now that she's Mrs. Norton, the chances are that she won't want to expose his majesty after all. I hope so, Watson, I hope so. But we can't afford to take any chances. I think the time is ripe for us to come to closer grips with the lady. Well, Holmes, now that we've eaten, perhaps you'll tell me your plan. With pleasure, my dear fellow. And while I'm so doing, I'll proceed with applying the makeup for my new disguise. Another disguise? What's it to be this time? I think the character and appearance of an amiable, simple-minded, nonconformist clergyman would be the most suited to my plan for entering Miss Adler's house. You're going to try and enter, then? I must, my dear fellow. I'm sure the photograph is there. Miss Adler, or rather Mrs. Norton, We'll return from her drive in the park at 6.30. We must be at Bryony Lodge to meet her. And what then? You must leave that to me. I've already made my arrangements. There's only one point on which I must insist. You must not interfere, come what may. You understand? I am to remain neutral? Yes. There will be some small unpleasantness. Don't join in. It will end my being conveyed into the house. As soon as I am able to, I shall open one of the windows. You are to watch from outside. When I raise my hand, you will throw an object that I shall give you through the window, and at the same time cry, fire! You follow me? Entirely. But what am I to throw? Oh, it's nothing very formidable. Here it is. Huh. Looks like a great big cigar. What is it? An ordinary plumber's smoke rocket fitted with a cap at either end to make it self-lighting. Your task is confined to throwing it through the window. When you raise a cry of fire, it will be taken up by quite a number of people. You may then walk to the end of the street, and I'll rejoin you in ten minutes. I hope I've made myself clear. Perfectly. Good. And now, old fellow, as soon as I've donned my clerical attire, let's be on our way. There's no time to be lost. It's nearly 6.30, Holmes. We've been pacing up and down in front of her house for half an hour now. I hope she does come back. I'm sure she will. There seem to be a lot of loafers hanging around her gates. All part of my conspiracy, old chap. You'll see them play their parts in a few minutes. You still think the photograph is inside the house? Yes. It's most unlikely that she carries it about with her. Remember, the king told us it was a large, framed picture. And also remember that she planned to use it within a few days. It must be where she can lay her hands on it. It must be inside her house. But her house has been burgled. Twice. Oh, psh. They didn't know how to look. How will you look? I won't. I'll get her to show me. Oh, she'll refuse. She won't be able to. Shh. Here comes the carriage now. Remember, Watson, carry out my orders to the letter. You can trust me. Good luck. Blimey. Here comes the Duchess of Tiddlywinks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put out a carpet. She might get her tootsies wet. Oh, put a sock in it, Alfie. Leave her alone. She's no better than she ought to be. <laughs> please, please, let me through. I live here. Well, ain't that nice. Well, I'll come in and have a cup of cocoa. <laughs> Move out of the way, please, and let the lady through. Oh, mind your own business. Just because your collar's turned the wrong way around, you can't spoil our fun. That's right, Hattie. Keep your nose out of it, Parson. Stop shoving, will you? Please, please, don't fight about it. Uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, stop molesting the lady, please. Do you? Then how would you like a biff on the nose, Mr. Clergyman? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she hit the poor man, and then she ran away, the coward. Is the clergyman badly hurt? He hit his head, ma'am, as he fell. If you ask me, he's hurt bad. Hey, he's bleeding something terrible. Can we bring him in, Mom? He can't lie here in the street. Oh, why, of course. Bring him in. Right you are, Mom. Here, Bert. Righto. Give us a hand. Uh, oh. Uh, uh. Poor fella. Did you see what happened to him, mister? 
Uh, yes, I saw, my good woman, a very convincing demonstration. What do you mean? Weren't you paid by um, a certain gentleman for this performance? Oh, you know about it, too. You must be a friend of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Yes, I am. A nice gentleman. He gave us five bottle piece for tonight's work. We ain't through, though, yet. We got to start yelling fire when somebody tells us. I'm that somebody, my dear. Oh, there's Mr. Holmes now. He's inside the house. Yes, he's opening a window. Now he's raising his hand. Oh, that's my signal. Now I throw the rocket. Ah, there we are. Fire! 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 Holmes, there you are. You, you have the photograph? No, but I know where it is. She showed me, as I told you she would. Well, I'm still in the dark. There's no mystery, old chap. When my accomplices started the row in the street, I had a little moist red paint in my hand. My good friend Alfie pretended to strike me. I clapped my hand to my head and fell down. It's an old trick. Uh, yes, I understand that. But how did my throwing the rocket help you? It was all important, my dear fellow. When a woman thinks her house is on fire, her instinct is at once to rush for the thing that she values most. A married woman grabs her baby. An unmarried one reaches for her jewel box. In this case, of course, it was the photograph. Where was it? In a recess in the living room, just above the right-hand bell pole. I caught a glimpse of it as she drew it out. When I made it known that the fire was a false alarm, she replaced the photograph. As soon as I was able to, I advised her that I was feeling well enough to leave. You didn't take the photograph, then? No. I felt that over-precipitance at this stage might ruin everything. What do we do now? Drive to the Langham Hotel and inform His Majesty of what has happened. Then return with him here. And after that, my dear chap, the case will be ended. This is Bryony Lodge, Your Majesty. I am all impatience. You're certain the photograph will still be there, Mr. Holmes? I have every reason to believe so, Your Majesty. I must confess, this is going to be something of an ordeal. Then I suggest that you let me do the talking, Your Majesty. I think I know how to handle the lady. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I believe? Yes, I am Mr. Holmes, but how did you know? My mistress told me you'd be likely to call. She's left for the continent with her husband. You mean she's left England? Never to return. Then the papers? And the photograph? Oh, all is lost! We'll soon see. Follow me. She said you'd be looking for something. I hope you find it. This was the bell rope. Sliding panel behind it. Uh-huh. Here it is. Is... Is the photograph there, Mr. Holmes? <clears throat> there is a photograph, Your Majesty, but it's um, a photograph of the lady alone. Here's a letter, and it's addressed to me. What does it say, Holmes? My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, you really did it very well. Until after the fire alarm, I had no suspicion. But then, when I realized how I had betrayed myself, I began to think. I had been warned that if the king employed an agent, he would certainly employ you. May I congratulate you on your disguise as a dear old clergyman. <laughs> Great Scott! She was much more clever than you thought, Holmes. Yeah, yeah, go on. What else does it say? <clears throat> My husband and I both thought that the best recourse was flight, so you will find the nest empty. As to the photograph of the king and myself, his majesty may rest in peace. Oh, thank goodness for that. I love and am loved by a better man than he. I leave another photograph, however, that he might care to possess. And I remain, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, very truly yours, Irene Norton, nay, Adler. <laughs> what a woman, Watson. What a woman. What a magnificent woman. She fooled me completely. But, oh, I, uh, um, I'm sorry, Your Majesty, I... I've been unable to bring your business to a more successful conclusion. On the contrary, my dear sir. Nothing could be more successful. I know that Irene's word is inviolate. The incriminating photograph is now as safe as if it were in the fire. Well, I'm glad to hear your majesty say so. I am immensely indebted to you. Pray, tell me in what way I can reward you. Uh, this, this barrel rings that I wear. 
I should be proud to Your be Majesty has something that I should value even more highly. You have but to name it. This photograph, sir. Irene's photograph. But certainly. However, you must let me give you something more substantial. Oh, no, 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 Your Majesty. This is something I shall treasure all my life. This and a golden sovereign I receive from the lady's hand. They will remind me that I was once tricked by a woman. A woman that I shall never forget. Gee, Doctor, what a woman that Miss Adler. Or, should I say, Mrs. Norton. That's the kind of a woman a fella could really go for. Yes, I believe one could. Just between ourselves, you know, I sort of <clears throat> could go for her myself. She was intelligent. She was rich. And beautiful. That's the kind of woman you want sitting next to you in front of a cozy fire on a nippy fall night. Just the three of you. The three of us? Mm-hmm. You, she, and a classic checked out from the Westmont Public Library. <laughs> Miss Cuneo! <laughs> well, why not? <laughs> Gracious. <laughs> oh, by the way, no one has to be without the use of a computer and internet Wi-Fi in Westmont. Westmont Public Library has computers available to their patrons with access to the internet. It's just another way the library helps their community to work, study, and play. Well, Dr. Watson, that was a great story you told us. I thought you'd like it, Miss Cuneo. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is an adaptation of the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, A Scandal in Bohemia. The Westmont Public Library invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Sharon Cuneo saying good night for the friends of Westmont Public Library. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Bulldog Drummond, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.